I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Kim Pepin and Dr. Andrew Golnar. Dr. Pepin is a quantitative ecologist at the National Wildlife Research Center, that's for USDA APHIS, in Fort Collins, Colorado, where she develops analytical tools for assisting the evaluation and implementation of wildlife damage and disease management programs, especially for feral swine and disease at the Wildlife Livestock Interface. Her research focuses on developing modeling tools for decision makers for objectives such as risk assessment, determining effective control strategies, designing surveillance, or predicting disease dynamics in space and time. Dr. Pepin completed a PhD in zoology from the University of Idaho, where she tested evol evolutionary theories of viral adaptation using experimental evolution and genetic methods. At the NWRC, Dr. Pepin has been integrating her expertise in evolutionary biology and disease modeling to develop decision-making tools for managing gene drive technology. Dr. Golnar is a disease ecologist trained in diverse methods of ecoepidemiology and medical entomology. He grew up throughout the Rocky Mountains in the small towns of Livingston, Montana, Kemmerer, Wyoming, and Salida, Colorado. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Denver and a Master's of Science in Entomology and a PhD in Entomology from Texas A&M University. Andrew is currently an APHIS Science Fellow with the United States Department of Agriculture stationed at the NWRC. In his current position, he is broadly focused on enhancing risk assessment capabilities and optimizing management strategies for pests and pathogens that threaten national security and non-lethal biocontrol strategies such as gene drive. Welcome, Kim and Andrew. Thanks for joining us today. Kim is going to be going first. So, Kim, if you'll please go ahead and start your presentation. I'll let you know when we can see your slides and can hear you. Well, thanks, Hector, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak in this exciting series. So, uh, as Hector mentioned, Andrew and I are going to talk about how dynamic models can help us with gene drive management and some of the current gaps and challenges we face with using models effectively to guide decisions. So before I jump into our objectives today, I just wanted to say a bit about NWRC for those of you who might not be familiar and to provide some context for my perspectives. So NWRC is a research organization within USDA APHIS in the Wildlife Services branch. And the mission of Wildlife Services is to resolve conflict between wildlife and humans. And we do this by working directly on private and public lands to mitigate wildlife damage and disease threats. So the charge of NWRC is to develop innovative tools and strategies to manage these threats. Whoops. Um, although we're a fairly small research organization, our scientists develop a wide array of tools involving research from many different disciplines, including, for example, non-lethal tools like like flagellary or fertility control, oral vaccines or repellents, to lethal tools such as toxicants or species-specific pesticides, um, to new tools for more efficient surveillance such as volatile compounds or biosensors, or methods for conducting economic assessments of damage to assess management impacts. We also have a genetic unit led by Tony Piaggio that has been developing gene drive technology for control of invasive rodents and a rodent control group led by Aaron Shields that has been developing a simulated natural environment for mice that can eventually be used to inform risk assessment for release. Now, um, where Andrew and I fit in is in this box over here. We work in collaboration with managers to develop ecological models for improving surveillance design or determining optimal control strategies for risk assessment uh, to inform decisions or to evaluate the impact of management actions. So basically, we work at the intersection of population ecology and management. And while we develop models that capture realistic ecology, we work with boots on the ground managers to address management objectives and issues so much of my perspective on using models um, to shape management decisions comes from working with managers. So with that in mind, I wanted to start with some challenges. Um, when I first put these slides together, I had this discussion more towards the end of the slides, but after a recent conversation with a decision maker colleague, I realized it might be better to 
discuss these challenges up front because it provides motivation and context for the content in this talk. Plus, I think it's useful for modelers and decision makers to keep these challenges at the forefront of their minds as they consider developing models for management applications. All of these challenges may be present or absent in different organizations, but being aware of all of them can help in any organization. So John made the nice point about trust being the number one issue, um, especially as models have become more used for prediction in the current pandemic. The public and decision makers are becoming more familiar and accepting with using models, but without clear communication, this can backfire. So in my organization, trust is a major challenge, partly because the use of models for decision making is not widespread. So many folks are unfamiliar with the process and partly because some folks have had an experience where the model made a prediction that didn't add up for them. So for example, um, a model predicted a density of 300 animals and then the manager removed 700. Um, and, and the lack of trust can also come from a lack of understanding of how the model works. For example, I had a recent experience where a decision maker said they'd prefer to use expert opinion um, on wildlife species abundance than results from a model of management data because they don't quite understand how the model works. So I've also had folks say they don't trust how the model, how the data are collected, and therefore they don't believe there's anything useful a model could show with the data. So obviously this is a very challenging place to start with informing decisions with models. Um, that can only be addressed through communication about how models work and how data collection biases can be accounted for. A second challenge is that models can feel impenetrable for those who didn't develop them. And sometimes there's a lack of desire to do the work to understand the components or results. And some folks just don't like being out of their comfort zone of knowledge. So overcoming this challenge requires cooperation from both the modeler who needs to produce very digestible, understandable explanations about how the model works. But we also need um, some input and um, uh, from the decision maker who needs to be willing to think about the results and ask questions. So collaboration where both parties invest effort is crucial but most often I hear comments such as, well, you're the modeler, you figure it out. Um, and that puts me in a really challenging situation because um, you know, as I'll talk about in more detail later throughout this talk, uh, the model, the objectives that you design the model for um, are really important in specifying. So it's fine for um, me to go away and figure out the technical aspects of the model, but not when it comes to making decisions about framing the problem and making assumptions that affect the results. So another potential or another challenge is expertise. So as models become used more and more and um, folks that are already present might not have as much expertise in um, the area of modeling, it becomes important to actually insert expertise, modeling expertise in the organization to help with the, the modeling process and decision making process. And, you know, with that expertise, then you can move on to standardization. So it could seem overwhelming to make a decision with a model if you have never gone through the pro modeling process and, and made a decision with models. And there's no standardization of that process, no standard operating procedure to um, take that on. And so that's how having modelers embedded within organizations can help um, develop these um, processes. And then, um, so just going back to the point of communication, another challenge is that oftentimes models are developed on a scale that might be different from the decision makers landscape. So there needs to be um, continued conversation, not for example, um, here's the objectives I need solved and then the modeler goes away and solves them and, and doesn't continue to interact throughout the process um, because those objectives can change slightly or new information can come to the table from the decision maker's mind that would, might reframe how the model needs to be set up. So there needs to be a constant um, communication between modelers and decision makers. And then um, lastly, I wanted to touch on change. So obviously that can be a challenge because maybe the decision maker has been using a certain methodology that they trust um, 
for doing their job and they're very busy and using models to make decisions requires a process change um, and change can always be challenging. So I just want to bring up some of those challenges to think about as I move through um, the rest of the talk. So we're going to break the talk into two sections. Uh, and the first I'm going to describe, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's a dynamic model, why we might um, use dynamic models for managing gene drives and um, describe kind of a very general framework for application. And so the first part of the talk is going to be geared more towards the non model or research scientist and decision makers. And then Andrew is going to move uh, on to talking about a specific application for dynamic models and gene drive management and some current modeling gaps and future directions. Um, so I want to take a step back first and just talk about what is a model. Um, and it's basically an idea about how a system works. And we use it as a tool um, to make inferences about the state of a system. So consider the situation where um, you move to a new neighborhood and you want to make um, a prediction about when it's best to go grocery shopping. And you, so you are, um, you're interested in the state of the grocery store at different times. And those are going to be your experiences and data that you collect. And your objective is to predict when the grocery store is going to be least busy. So you go on Sunday night and you find the shelves are empty. You go on Saturday afternoon and you find there's a lot of families with full carts in the grocery store. It's very busy. You go out weekdays at dinner time and you see there's long lines. People are impatient trying to get their groceries for dinner. And so from all this data, you make the prediction that Saturday morning is the best time to find full shelves and few shoppers. And you find you're right about that. But then one Saturday morning, you go right before a big game um, and you find, oh, there's all empty shelves and um, long lines of people. And so you update your model with this new piece of information. And now your model predicts Saturday mornings when there is not a big game is the best time to find full shelves and few shoppers. Now, the reason I wanted to go through this example is because a key point here is that a model can always be changing as more data and experience are incorporated. So I want to make the point that models are based on current knowledge and models can be changed with additional knowledge. Um, and I bring this up because sometimes I have decision makers say to me, ask, um, oh, is assumption X in the model? And um, maybe it's not in the model, maybe it is. And the response is, well, the model's all crap. And so I just want to make the point that we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, the model can be updated by adding that other assumption that you think is really important. Um, so some other guidelines for decision makers and modelers to think about together are um, know the assumptions that produce the results. So this is um, this goes back to the collaboration and communication between modelers and decision makers. Um, if, if decision makers play a large role in the development in the model, and I don't mean writing down the math equations, but the, the components, the important components in framing the question, the, the decision maker will be more familiar with what the model's doing and what, um, what assumptions it's relying on for their decision-making process. And then the next piece is, um, to ask for analyses that show how results depend on assumptions. So in the case where sometimes I have decision makers feel really strongly about a certain assumption, but I know from the model structure that particular assumption is really not going to make a big difference. Um, and so this can help in both ways. It could help if you, if you ask for results um, that show how the model depends on the assumptions, then you can understand actually when you have a very important assumption that needs to be correct versus an assumption that you don't really need to worry about. Um, and you can do this with sensitivity analysis. So a lot of modelers, um, even in the previous sessions, talked about the importance of sensitivity analysis. And then um, some other things to think about are, um, so to collect data to make sure the assumptions are correct. So now that you understand the assumptions, um, you want to understand that 
they are correct assumptions uh, and whether you need to um, collect more data. And then um, ask for evaluation of predicted outcomes. So does the model match observation? And then another thing I run into is um, asking for one number. So this isn't widespread across all decision makers, but some decision makers want to want one number because uncertainty makes the decision landscape more complicated for them. And I think as a field, we need to move towards how to make decisions under uncertainty rather than requiring one number because you can um, you want to, the decision maker want, should be thinking about um, the transparency in uncertainty and understanding what the risk and making the decision is based on the distribution of outcomes. Um, so there's not just one outcome and the other speakers touched on this issue as well. There are often many different outcomes and you can think about this in terms of outbreaks, for example, in, in any given set of ecological conditions, you could have 80% of the time, zero cases, and 20% of the time, a thousand cases. And if you take the average of that, that's not a very useful number. So now I'm gonna move on to what's a dynamic model. And uh, Michael touched on this nicely in terms of um, gene, the gene drive um, system as being something that varies in space and time. And so we need to be accounting for that. And a dynamic model is something that changes over time. You're modeling a system that changes over time. And then two other features. One is that it's, it, it's mechanistic. And so we take processes that we understand about how a system works and we put them together in a way that we think um, they would interact. And then from those, we write down equations to describe how those processes are interacting based on our knowledge. And from that, we, the system behavior emerges. So we're interested in allele frequencies over time or population density. So we get um, an emerging behavior from the system. And um, to think about how that might be different from some other techniques you might use an environmental risk assessment. So let's say you're interested in um, registration of a new pesticide. Um, a common uh, technique for evaluation is to require experiments where you look at um, an amount of pesticide in um, the effects of an amount, amount of pesticide on population suppression. And you can summarize this in a statistical model and measure the effect of that amount of pesticide on population suppression. So, these are two contrasting ways, but also complementary ways that you can um, model data. And in the context of gene drive, that experiment might look like something like um, you introduce gene drive at different frequencies in different populations and measure population suppression. So there are advantages and disadvantages of using different techniques for risk assessment or um, estimating effectiveness. Um, and in the dynamic model, um, it allows us to learn and observe dynamics we didn't know could occur. So we put together our knowledge of the system, but it's a complex system. And so we might not necessarily know what the emerging dynamics will look like. We ha will have predictions, but because um, it's a complex system, we might learn something new having this mechanistic description allows us to learn something new. Um, and so the dynamic model can help with um, planning release and risk management for many different settings. So this is something that uh, statistical techniques are often not good at is predicting out of sample. Um, and, but by having a mechanistic understanding of the system, we might be able to better predict in different settings because we understand how all the pieces work together. Um, and then uh, obviously with the, with the gene drive situation, one of the limitations with using statistical techniques is we just currently can't do this. We can't release gene drives and measure how, um, what, what the effects are on population suppression in many different settings. Um, and then a disadvantage of the dynamic modeling can be its 
complexity. So there, and, and Jeff talked about this, he talked about um, model uncertainty, the structural uncertainty and the parametric uncertainty. So the uncertainty and how you're putting the components together and then the values of that you assign to those processes. Um, and, but the point I've been trying to make so far is that this, com this uncertainty can be reduced by targeted data collection and then model refinement. And um, then a current gap, a, an advantage of the, of the statistical technique is this can provide a valuation for the mechanistic model to help that iterative refinement process. But a current gap that we face and um, need to figure out is how can we do this for gene drives safely? How can we provide this evaluation for mechanistic models um, in a safe way? Um, and then the second thing that um, the statistical approach can do for the dynamic model is to is to test model assumptions. And so a specific example of what I mean here is like, let's say you have your dynamic model. Um, one thing you want to know is how well does the model predict observation. And so you go out and you um, measure these outcomes, which we can't yet do, but um, we need to talk through how we could do this safely. Uh, and then the second piece is, well, we want to understand how, whether the assumptions of the model are correct. And so here, for example, we're saying like, well, dispersal depends on density and we can um, do sensitivity analysis. And if we find that, well, dispersal is a really important parameter to understand well because it affects our outcome strongly, then we might go out and measure, well, what is the function for dispersal on density and um, better understand how what that connection in the model looks like. So now I'm just going to go over sort of a general um, standard operating procedure for modeling. So the first step is uh, model development. Um, and that involves defining the objectives of the model. And this is where um, the decision maker is really important. Um, and the second is to identify the processes expected to affect the outcome. Uh, and again, these, this will be defining your assumptions uh, that are most important and then connecting those processes based on current knowledge. So now we're gonna sit down and we're going to figure out what we know about the system and put it together in the way we know best. And then the next step is model analysis. So now we can understand the effects of these different processes we put in the system and identify potential interactions and potentially observe new phenomena. And then, um, Based on those results, we can do informed data collection. So maybe we identified a parameter that we don't have a lot of data about, but it's causing a huge um, impact on results. So that allows us to streamline how we're going to collect our data. And we're going to collect our data to decrease uncertainty about those really important processes. And then the last step is model evaluation. So this is where we want to um, evaluate whether the model is making good predictions relative to what we observe in nature. Um, and then this can also help us identify relationships that might be inaccurate. And then we want to update the model structure and input data. So this is the process um, of modeling that uh, the decision maker has a role in almost every step. Um, and now I'll just talk about how we might apply this process or, or dynamic models in general to um, development and management of gene drive. Um, so currently the development of gene drives are happening in, in this phase pathway where first it's um, the geneticists are developing constructs in the lab and then second evaluating them in, in a mo model system, maybe a test tube of fruit flies or um, something art, more artificial, and then um, evaluating in a semi-natural environment. So maybe this is a captive um, field-based evaluation um, before release into a natural system and then post-release surveillance. So at the first step, a dynamic model can help with understanding whether the idea 
um, for the construct being developed has potential to meet management objectives. So in this case, you might be most interested in varying the drive mechanism or the traits that are being targeted. And then at the second step, um, the dynamic model could help with understanding what genetic features the construct must have to be successful. So there've been several, quite a few models now, um, varying genetic parameters like resistance or homing rates. And you could use models to help um, fine tune what these need to be um, to be successful to meet some management objective. And then at the third phase, um, here we want to improve our knowledge of how different ecological factors can affect the effectiveness of gene drives in natural populations. So here um, we might be interested because it's not because it's a semi natural environment, we might not be able to look at spatial ecological factors, but we can look at a lot of different non spatial ecological factors like how density uh, or sex ratios or mating systems might affect um, the spread of the gene drive in a natural population. And then um, at the phase of release, um, here we're really interested in predicting the effectiveness, so the rates of spatial spread under different ecological conditions. We want to understand how these different ecology is going to affect the spread. And um, we can use those results also to determine um, risk in different ecological settings. And so here we might be interested in varying spatial ecological factors like dispersal or mating related home range size. And then at the last phase where we ha have conducted a release and we are doing post-release surveillance, um, we can use these models to um, evaluate effectiveness and risks and refine the models through uh, fitting them to the surveillance data. So this is sort of that back and forth importance of the statistical approaches and dynamic modeling approaches I was mentioning. So just to summarize um, why dynamic models are useful for development um, and management of gene drives. So um, the first point is for assessing, they, they can be used to assess risk for conditions that we can't yet measure in nature. Um, and this is really important for guiding regulation and management. And then I mentioned they can help streamline development. So there are many, many different conditions that um, are infeasible experimentally. So by doing this iterative process of dynamic modeling and model refinement um, and understanding what parameters are most sensitive and which ones you don't understand enough about, that can help streamline what, which data need to be collected most. Um, and then finally, models can help us identify the unknown unknown. So these things we don't know that we don't know, these are things we don't have predictions about because we are unaware they could occur. So if we can model these, these complex systems, we can sometimes observe behaviors that we didn't know could occur and could help us help inform risk assessment. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna pass it off to Andrew, um, who's gonna talk about the way forward with dynamic models with some specific applications and um, some a gap analysis with modeling. So where we need to go from here with modeling so that we can best inform the decision process. Great, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as a follow-up to Kim's slides, uh, my talk will be a high-level overview on how we're using models to manage risks associated with gene drives. By describing some of our current work, I hope I can help bring some uh, perspective to the role models can play within the process of gene drive management. Um, in my current position as an APHIS science fellow, I utilize models to advance our understanding of complex ecological systems by merging concepts of ecology and genetics to manage pests like feral swine uh, and pathogens like African swine fever virus. Building models to advance our understanding of gene drive systems is a natural extension of this work. Let's see here. All right. So with external partners and internal partners, I've been working to identify gaps in our ability to realistically model gene drive dynamics, uh, provide guidelines on how to model gene drive behaviors, and to build flexible modeling tools that can be utilized to assess gene drive systems. But really, all these goals are contingent on developing a philosophy around the utility of dynamic models. 
So currently, gene drive technology development is facing this chicken or the egg problem, where we can't fully know how safe and effective gene drives are until we release them into the wild. But we don't want to release them into the wild until they are safe and effective. So considering any release of a gene drive needs to be a calculated risk, models are one of the lowest risk tools we have to preemptively evaluate if a gene drive strategy is safe to release. So how do models help us manage gene drive risks? On the left, I've provided a non-exhaustive list of factors that could influence gene drive behavior. Our goal is to understand when a certain gene drive based management strategy is too risky. So Plinkle boards are surprisingly helpful for illustrating the value of models. So imagine that the chip represents the gene drive modified organism we plan to release into the environment. And each peg on the board represents a unique variable. Models allow us to study how each peg influences the movement of the chip, but also allow us to predict whether the chip will emerge in a low or high risk compartment. The more we know about each peg on this board, the better we can predict how the chip will move through the board and where it will end up. So models allow us to not only predict likelihood of lower high risk outcomes, which is helpful for regulatory decisions, they also help us build hypotheses on how we can alter different pegs to guide the chip into a low risk outcome. To help move towards the realistic evaluation of gene drive strategies, our goal is to build modeling tools that are specified with realistic assumptions. So based on the current status of the field, mating systems and animal movement patterns remain a neglected topic and are the focus of some of our modeling work. So mating systems can play a significant role in driving genetic inheritance over space and over time. So for example, monogamous species mate for life and therefore females will only create offspring with one partner, which may slow gene drive spread well, on the other side of the spectrum, males and females of promiscuous species demonstrate no mating preferences and everyone mates with everyone, which will likely create no barriers to drive spread. So in between these two extremes, we have polygamy where one sex mates with multiple individuals of the other sex. In polygonous systems, males mate with multiple females, which may increase the importance of dominant males to gene spread while in polyandrous systems, females mate with multiple male partners, which may decrease the importance of males in gene drive spread. Prior studies demonstrate that polygamous breeding systems and population rec recruitment functions can impact the efficacy of gene drive invasion. So highlighting a need to integrate realistic mating system assumptions into dynamic models of gene drive. Um, below, I listed a few papers for your re reference um, and considering mating systems can play an important role in dictating inheritance. One of our goals has been to build models that allow us to evaluate how gene drive dynamics differ between different mating systems. <clears throat> so to get at this question, we first developed a discrete time model for diploid organisms structured by age, sex, and genotype. Uh, our model is a hybrid model adapted from a previously published study, um, and it also utilizes a birth function capable of capturing polygamous mating structure. The model tracks the daily change in abundance for three genotypes listed on the left. So we have wild type organisms, um, we have heterozygotes that carry one drive allele, and we have homozygotes that carry two copies of the drive allele. So notice in the diagram um, that all these subpopulations are influenced by birth, death, and maturation from juvenile populations to adult stages. Although there are no, or, although there are numerous gene drive strategies to potentially replace or suppress wild populations, this model is specified to drive a payload gene into a population using a replicator system that effectively converts heterozygote gametes into homozygote gametes. With the goal of suppressing the target population, this model also assumes that these transgenic alleles carry a fitness penalty which effectively reduces embryo viability. So basically heterozygote individuals predominantly contribute transgenic alleles to the next generation based on the efficiency of drive conversion. This then increases the inheritance of the deleterious phenotype and reduces the overall abundance of the managed population. So using molecular and demographic parameters previously described in literature, we were able to explore how gene drive may be behave in mice. 
<clears throat> in this scenario, we specify gene conversion to be 95% efficient and the phenotypic impact of transgenic alleles to be 100% lethal in homozygotes. Thus, no homozygotic individuals survive birth. We assume that sex-specific demographic features are equal to base values obtained from the literature. So the light and dark blue lines indicate drive-carrying individuals, while the decreasing dotted gray line is the original wild-type population, and the black line is the total population of all genotypes. We can see that after releasing homozygotic drive individuals um, into the system, the total population is reduced to just over 20% of the original wild type population size. <clears throat> As noted in previous presentation, there are a number of features of this dynamic behavior we can evaluate. So for example, as highlighted by letter B and letter C, we may be interested in the maximum size the transgenic population may reach and how quickly it may occur. Or as highlighted by D and E, we may be interested in the minimum size of the wild type population and how quickly that reduction may be achieved. Or at point F, we may be interested in the final population size once an equilibrium is reached or whether transgenic genes are expected to per persist or not. As highlighted by G, we may also want to calculate the total change in population size relative to the original wild type population, often referred to as genetic load. All of these questions are relevant to interpreting the spatial and temporal scope of gene drive management strategies. <clears throat> now that our model seems to be behaving as expected, we can explore how a gene drive system may behave across a diversity of parameter inputs. So here I vary parameters for three values while holding all the other parameters stable to understand how these parameters may impact the total population size over time. For the most part, it is evident that the variation in all parameters will alter the impact of a gene drive tool. Um, results qualitatively indicate that variation in different parameters can have different relative impacts. So for example, at point A, um, population size is expected to significantly decrease as the homozygotic fitness impact moves from 60% to 80%. However, a similar change in magnitude from a homozygotic fitness impact of 80% to 100% does not appear to influence the final population sizes significantly. Meanwhile, at point B, introduction size appears to demonstrate more threshold dependent dynamics. So understanding the relative importance of these different parameters on model output can identify key parameters to study, but also key parameters we can try to manipulate to manage the system. <clears throat> With the understanding that all parameters may be variable across a range of values, we can then utilize sensitivity analyses like lat hypercube sampling to quantify the impact of parameter variability on the overall output of the system. Basically, by simulating the model thousands of times under different parameter sets, we can then calculate the relative influence of each parameter and its influence on a specific output. In this particular example, we're asking what is the relative importance of each parameter in determining the value of maximum suppression? We specified the variation in these parameters to match those determined by prior studies in mice. Results indicate at point A that adult mortality, regardless of sex, is positively associated with max population suppression, while at point B, birth capacity is negatively associated with maximum suppression. Um, additionally, at point C, it confirms that introduction size is generally always positively associated with maximum suppression. But at point D, results suggest that rates of male juvenile mortality are not always associated with a higher maximum suppression. A dynamic to consider if we're releasing gene drives in habitats where maybe juvenile males seem to be more successful, like, I don't know, a research-rich ag setting. <clears throat> we can also evaluate how different parameters influence different dynamic outputs, such as what's the expected change in the population equilibrium. So at point A, we see that variations in heterozygote, heterozygote fitness are estimated to always be negatively associated with max suppression. While at point B, under a different question, the relative influence of these parameters straddles zero. Additionally, we tend to see more variation um, in output B compared to output. A. This example illustrates that the relative importance of different parameters 
changes between questions. So therefore it's critical when using dynamic models to inform decisions that we make our questions specific. Additionally, we can utilize this modeling framework to compare the role of different parameters in determining drive dynamics in different species. So briefly, if we ask the same questions as the previous slides, but instead this time for mosquitoes, we can see that development rate highlighted by point A varies across species and between questions. In mosquitoes, development rate appears to be more negatively associated with max suppression and genetic load than in mice. This exercise illustrates that the relative importance of parameters in dictating drive dynamics is dependent on the specific question and the unique parameter values of the tar target organism. <clears throat> All right, <laughs> so getting back to our goals, we want to determine how mating systems influence gene drive dynamics. When we run this model specified to polygonous and polyandrous systems and compare it to monogamous system, we can see that mating system does appear to qualitatively impact the expected dynam dynamics of this particular drive mechanism, and that the effect is slightly influence, influenced by introduction and size. But from these results, polygony is predicted to augment suppression. So you can see that in the purple, while polyandry is expected to protect against suppression, which we can see in the orange. This is in line with recently published results that provide evidence that polyandry may protect against gene drive suppression. However, under a different mechanism of uh, gene drive. <clears throat> All right, so through sensitivity analysis, we can then compare across mice and mosquito species using parameters adapted from previously published studies. This heat map displays the relative importance of different parameters in driving a certain output. So the darker red values represent more positive association and darker blue values represent a more negative association. We just focus on female adult mortality in this heat map, which is indicated at point A, we can broadly see that the relative importance of different parameters in predicting max suppression does not change between mating systems and mice. However, it does seem to play an important role in driving the dynamics of gene drive suppression in mosquitoes. Then comparing between questions, we can then see that the relative importance of different parameters um, across mating systems, species, and outputs of interest um, for example, in case, indicated by the black line labeled A, the relative importance of drive conversion in females appears to be similar across different species and questions. Meanwhile, at point B, the influence of male mortality appears, appears to vary within and among species and the dynamic output of interest. As we build out this modeling framework, we also want to include animal movement behavior. As we know, different species travel different distances between mating events, and, and that even within species, males and females have different movement patterns. So by expanding simpler models of gene drive inheritance with realistic details like animal movement behavior and mating behavior, we're aiming to create flexible tools that can be used to assess the dynamics of a wide range of pest species. So ultimately, we plan on leveraging this tool to produce multiple model outputs that can guide and communicate diverse questions of risk and efficacy. However, before we get ahead of ourselves through exploration of our modeling structure as currently formed, there are limitations that indicate more work is needed. So specifically, when we alter the drive mechanism to a sex disorder, we start running into questionable predictions. So in this plot, we are tracking abundance for male and female transgenic organisms under different mating systems. Dark purple is drive carrying females and light purple is drive carrying males. At first glance, we see similar predictions where polygony seems to augment um, suppression and polyandry appears to protect from suppression. However, when we look at this last graph on the right, we can see that the population is persisting with a heavily skewed population sex ratio. So as currently constructed, our model basically assumes that the population can persist at a rather high abundance, even when there are very few females. Um, and I think it's important to note that this model is not a failure, but it did its job. It illustrates an important direction for future research. And uh, we really need to do a better, a better job to understand the functional response of mating inheritance under dynamic sex ratios. So, this is a good time to re-emphasize one of Kim's points, that models are a tool to help us build knowledge around a system and that the process of modeling in itself is dynamic. 
So this dynamic concept of data-driven model development and model-guided data collection is critical to piecing together how different biological phenomena, such as DNA repair, mate choice, or predator-prey dynamics may function as a whole and influence gene drive behavior. <clears throat> the, the phase pathway provides a framework to test and fine tune gene drive products as Kim presented, but how do we optimally address all the different processes that could feasibly influence gene drive dynamics? So as Kim covered, dynamic models can help this process by highlighting gaps in our understanding and providing a framework to pull together our knowledge of different processes to estimate how gene drives will behave as a whole. Another way we can help optimize the process of gene drive management and then build trust amongst modelers and various stakeholders is to build guidelines on what biological assumptions are reasonable to make at different levels of the phase testing pathway. So we're com current, currently completing a literature review of gene drive models to help with this effort. So essentially, the scope of this review will cover dynamic models of replicator, interference, and underdominance gene drive systems, which have been built to answer a variety of questions relating to gene drive behavior. Um, I, you know, I think it's important to note that this is still pre preliminary work, and we're only about halfway through um, the papers that we've collected. So the, re the raw data I'm sharing today represents information on model features described by about 27 papers um, that are mainly tracking the dynamics of replicator systems. So once complete, we will be able to dissect the results across a variety of factors, such as drive architecture, management goal, or stage within the phase pathway. The overall goal of the literature review is to understand where we have been with models so we can identify gaps, but also this review will paint a picture on which assumptions should be addressed at different levels of research throughout the phase pathway. So in this figure, we are looking at the number of times different genetic, ecological, spatial, and environmental features have been specified within the structure of gene drive models. So without any real analyses, we can see that genetic processes are the most common model features of gene drive models, followed by ecological, spatial, and environmental processes. So we're also looking at which features have been varied by these studies to understand their relative role in driving gene drive behavior. So again, results suggest that genetic features have received the most attention thus far, and there's work needed to look into questions ecological, spatial, and environmental scope. So when we try to account for the relative impact of different parameters through some sort of effect size, um, as dictated by the author's interpretation of their results, we see that features at all scales are important to gene drive behavior. Finally, when we aggregate the number of times different authors suggest future avenues of research, we can see that a number of features are highlighted in purple that have not been integrated in any models thus far, such as epistasis, interspecific interactions or questions of integrated control and questions of spatial movement. So as I said, our expectation is not to use this data to identify, or as I said, our expectation is to use this data to identify gaps in knowledge and to formulate modeling guidelines. So here on the top left is a short list of pests and pathogens of agricultural concern the USDA is actively managing. Considering these tools may, develop, may be developed for a variety of species and management goals, flexible models that can help us judge how these technolo technologies will behave in realistic scenarios will be key to efficiently managing risks and allocating resources effectively. Before we can achieve flexibility, we need to know the scope of factors that are at play. So I, as we wrap up this review, we plan to use some of the qualitative modeling tools discussed by Jeff last, last week, like network analyses or Bayesian belief networks to help identify parameters that are influential in propagating uncertainty throughout a gene drive system. One fallback of this approach is that the overall structure on how biological processes are interacting from molecular scales to ecological scales, it, it's always gonna be fuzzy. So to help, to help account for uncertainty that arises out of these structural differences in our theoretical understanding of biological systems, it'll be important to analyze a variety of qualitative structures based on expert input to test the robustness of our insights. So in summary, our goal is to bring order to the seemingly chaotic nature of gene drives using a model-guided research methodology. 
that will require ongoing theoretical developments and empirical research. And these models will come in all shapes and sizes. So we develop more simple models to guide lab work. And then when less variables are at play, we develop more complex models to guide research in more realistic ecosystems where more variables at play. So by embracing a, a modeling process that involves data-driven model development and model-driven data collection throughout the phase pathway, we can iteratively enhance our understanding of complex systems. The idea of iterating between empirical observations and model-based observations is not novel, but it requires strong communication. And so through our work, we are attempting to facilitate this process by elucidating guidelines on what model features should be included at each stage of research. Uh, I wanna end my talk with a few thoughts. Um, as mentioned in previous talks, dynamic models are just one of many tools and decisions around risk and effectiveness will likely be dictated by an ensemble of models and weighted evidence. Um, also, there's a lot of interest in establishing modeling guidelines. In part, our work here you know, is helping on this front by bringing organization to a range of features that could impact gene drive dynamics. Um, but as mentioned in a prior session, I think it's a great, it's a good idea to build a database of functional forms uh, to facilitate the modeling of diverse processes. I think really the question that remains is who will lead that effort and who will contribute and who will maintain the database and really will there be a constant flow of money to kind of maintain um, an open database that's up to date with a fast developing field. Finally, I think it can't be overstated enough that everyone needs to be involved in the development, interpretation, and adjustment of dynamic models. So model structure matters, the range of realistic parameters we observe in nature matters, and the specifics of the question matter. So we all need to do our due diligence to decompose and communicate around these complex models and make sure that they are appropriate. These types of conversations can be very uncomfortable. Um, because of differences in expertise or jargon or values. Um, but these conversations will be crucial in managing gene drive technology. Um, and with that, uh, I think I'm, I'm done. We can move on to the uh, questions session. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, if I, for one, I'm going to be very looking forward to seeing that review because I think it'll be very valuable in putting all of these you know, just describing all these different models and the, the way that people have looked at this and put it all in one place that we can at least uh, take a look at what's been done so far. And as you say, identify the gaps. Um, I, I'd like to start out, first of all, by referring back to Kim's part of the presentation, because it was to me very obvious from the first comments that Kim made that the conclusion that you know, in, in, involving decision makers from the beginning in terms of the formulation of models and also modelers being needing to be embedded in an organization that has decision makers uh, in, the, in it leads me to conclude that one of the important things is really educating decision makers and how to use or interpret models. And uh, my question to begin this is, whether this is something that's a uh, going to be an intentional um, activity at USDA or other regulatory agencies in the, in the US regulatory system? That's a really good question, Hector. Um, I'm not aware of a movement towards incorporating expertise directly. Um, but, but that said, there is the APHIS fellowship program that Andrew's part of that is meant to attract uh, expertise that may be lacking to different APHIS programs um, and develop those expertise. And there have been two fellows recently that were quantitative modelers that are now being integrated into APHIS. So, um, you know, although that plan the AFIS Fellowship Program didn't set out specifically to develop modeling skills. It is a mechanism by which it's happening. Um, and I was hired there seven, seven years ago. <laughs> um, so I think that is happening, but it might not have been planned to be happening. 
and I'm I'm advocating for it. <laughs> Good. I hope <laughs> I hope that's successful. Um, <laughs> So uh, let me turn next to then the, the questions that, that we have written in the in the chat. And the first one is by Wayne Landis, who, by the way, I just want to ad, uh, make the ad, uh, advertisement that he'll be the one uh, giving the, the talk next week. And Wayne says, it's a very nice introduction to the use of models and making decisions. Risk is defined as probability. In the models presented here, I don't see the probabilistic approach, but it's easy to add. Why not go to probabilistic models? There are many examples in wildlife management. Bayesian networks are particularly adaptable to such approaches. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. Um, and I think that really, you know, you got to start somewhere. And so um, <laughs> I would say, you know, a lot of this is also my introduction to this type of work. And so Basically, when you're starting simple, you're trying to understand if there's a, a simpler approach to ask a question. And our question really was relating to um, mating systems. And so we were building some population dynamic models, but really we're, we're moving towards building individual based models and then integrating a stochastic approach that then allows you to do more probabilistic um, inference. Um, but yeah, I think that a Bayesian um, belief network approach is something that we're also discussing to kind of understand interactions and how uncertainty propagates through, you know, these diverse processes um, of different scales. Uh, and I, you know, I think that these tools as currently specified are basically growing and developing and creating communication. Um, but yeah, I think that's the direction that we're going. Yeah, and I'd like to add that, um... Andrew touched on this at the end too. Like we've been thinking about the modeling piece as kind of a two-stage process where, you know, you might remember he put up the network graph at the end. Um, and basically what we're thinking is you can use these dynamic models to better understand how different processes impact outcomes in different ecological contexts. And then you could layer on top of that a Bayesian network analysis um, for the decision maker to guide risk in different settings. So we were thinking about, you know, the dynamic models in the sense of improving the learning about risk. And then you could have this more holistic framework for the decision maker. Um, that's, I think, very similar to what Wayne might be talking about. Great. Thanks for, thanks for the answers. The next one's from Michael Montague. I'm just going to read the read it. He says vector organisms might be might be the vector for more than for far more than the, just one parasite, and each parasite might infect far more than just one host. This seems to matter to the problem of ecological modeling, since while one would expect that most species might have a predator-prey relationship with only a few other species in the ecosystem a vector species might contribute to the burden of disease on potentially nearly every other organism in the entire ecosystem from bacteria to plants to animals. Notably, this kind of nested one to many ecological parasite complexity would not be expected in a captive or laboratory model system. It would only exist in the less constructed environments and even then might cause dynamics that emerge on a very long time scales as they involve the generation times of potentially the longest lived species in the environment and thus not be recapitulated in normal model validation efforts. The question is, in your experience, how important in gene drive modeling is it to know the complete list of all parasites? Well, I mean, I guess my first comment, this is very related to my dissertation work, which was kind of focused on polyparasitism and like just interact interactions of just those parasites and how that might influence each other. But I think in the end, what you're talking about is a very complex ecological system. And so the questions we've been asking at this point haven't even been integrating in more of this community um, based approach, but you know, the talk last week, and then I think Wayne's talk coming up, they, focus on more like ecological scale and these interactions. But yeah, I think that if you look into like invasion biology um, uh, work, it's, it's really difficult to study entire systems. And so really you have to develop an important tool to kind of get at 
um, what's actually happening. So yeah, for multiple parasites, you know, we, we do know that if a vector is influencing that and you get rid of that vector, then you're probably going to suppress those parasites across all those species. And so the question remains that if you're allowing those populations maybe to be released from the pressure of disease, is that going to have any unintended effects? And that's, yeah, where you kind of have to explore those and put together those um, hypotheses. Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, we spoke specifically about population level modeling, but as Andrew mentioned, that you could use these tools for community level questions as well. And those are gonna be just as important. And I think missing gaps right now, I'm sure the review will highlight that. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I, I'm really looking forward to that review. <laughs> uh, back to Wayne again. Um, he asks that uh, resistance can develop in gene drives and how is that incorporated he says he's suspicious of population models that assume equilibrium population size, because he said um, that they use models as derived by the Marshall Lab at UC Berkeley. Do you have any comment on that approach? And by the way, he says he likes how you discussed Monte Carlo approaches to communicate the sensitivity analysis approach to the audience. So, yeah, yeah I mean, resistance is important, right? And as currently constructed, it's not involved. And I think part of that's because when we add it in, we just have to track another, you know, subpopulation for, a, you know, for both juvenile and different sexes. And so it just complicates the model. And really, we we're just trying to make sure it was working. So like I said, this is still like preliminary analyses. On, and yeah, I think that especially for a replicator system, where, you know, you can have DNA repair mechanisms that then change the target site. Um, it's incredibly important. You can also have standing genetic resistance in the population that needs to be accounted for. And I think overall models for replicator systems demonstrate unless you can avoid resistance development through like, you know, some sophisticated, um, uh, you know, uh, model or a genetic construct development that it's gonna rescue these populations. And so in a way, if those are involved, it might impact efficacy. Um, we might not see as the impact that we're expecting to be as long or as to be as large, um, but maybe from a risk perspective, it might be good in the sense that we might expect the um, gene drive element to kind of be pushed out through resistance. But yeah, I mean, it's important to capture depending on the gene drive mechanism you're looking at and a replicator system should account for resistance. But I think this also comes down to how much complexity can you add in one model and understand the processes you're interested in? And so I think the way Andrew and I have been coming at this problem is, um, you know, design a model for the question at hand um, and understand that piece of the puzzle. And then, you know, once you understand one piece you, or, or each piece, then you can sort of put those pieces together in a more holistic risk assessment framework. But to put every single process that um, Andrew was showing in the gap analysis for the modeling review um, in one model, that makes it a lot more complicated as a starting point to understand what pieces of the model are uncertain, what the model, the structural uncertainty in the model. Um, so it, it's not, I don't think it's a good starting point to put everything possible in there. Um, Caroline Ridley asks, how did you choose the models that feature in your review? Um, so are they identified a priori or did you add features as you read papers during your review? And I guess she has a follow-up question. Did they include features decision makers have expressed interest in? Yeah, so I think the, the initial onset was to be very systematic and basically create um, a list of features that I'm gonna like, you know, tick off as I'm reading through these articles. But the reality is it, is it was adaptive, right? Because on the onset, I didn't know all the features that were involved. And so really it was like, as I'm reading through over time, adding in those features and making sure that, you know, I, I listed those for all the other documents. So yeah, it was very adaptive process. I had hypotheses at the start, but it adapted as, you know, more features I learned about. Great. Um, 
Um, I'm going to move on then. Uh, Brian Huot asks, well, first of all, comments, the nice presentation, Andrew. When you calculate pam parameter sensitivity, I wonder if a multi-level interactive effect accounted for the power of each parameter. Mm. Also, he's impressed by the multi-tests, i.e. thousands of times tested in the sensitivity analysis, and is curious which sensitivity analysis you used for this model. He'd like to learn more about it. And lastly, he wonders if path analyses, ecological or genetic, can be incorporated into this model to evaluate multi-level effect of the parameters. Um, okay, I'll start with the sensitivity analysis question. So th these use Latin hypercube sampling techniques. And if you want more information on that or even code, uh, maybe in email me directly and I can just kind of provide that. Um, but yeah, I think that getting at interactive effects that the output for this is generally a relative score. So it's like relatively positive, relatively negative, And then you get signed up sort of that um, error around um, the, the magnitude. So it could, you know, straddle zero implying that sometimes it doesn't matter. Uh, but I think that really what we want to move towards in our next kind of attempt at this is building some sort of a predictive model. So then we can get at um, a better understanding of interactions between these terms and then also use it to predict. Uh, and then I, fear, I think your other question was relating to um, a pathway analysis. And that's, yeah, we've been talking about that for at least an, a year now. And I think that part of the pathway analysis is you need a structure to analyze. And so, you know, our hope is that through literature review, we're going to develop the components that go into that structure. But in reality, we're going to need a number of experts to kind of vet how we piece it together and basically do that analysis under different sets of, you know, network structures and, you know, how different compartments are connected. Because in reality is we're categorizing nature there. We don't fully know how everything's interacting and it could change, you know, seasonally. Um, and so really we need to account for these structural uncertainties in the analysis. And we're hoping that expert opinion can kind of help elicit that. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Dave Obrachta asks if, um, if we, you, either one of you could expand on the call for guidelines, he wasn't quite clear what you were referring to. Um, Kim, would you? Oh, I was just going to say for, in my part of the presentation, I was referring to like a standard operating procedure for using modeling to make decisions. Like, I don't feel like that exists. I, 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 I can speak for that in like my particular agency, but, um, uh, it might exist in, for example, NIH or CDC, I'm not sure, but uh, we don't have something like that. And so it becomes very overwhelming if there's no procedure to follow in how to use a model to make a decision. Um, and you use a different model every time and there's no procedure for evaluating it, then um, I think that the process can be less trusted and also complicated for the decision maker. So I was speaking very broadly like that, but I think we are also speaking more specifically like, um, like some of the other uh, speakers spoke about, oh, can we make a set of algorithms that are like standardized? Um, so there's this resource that we can go to that everyone's using the same structure because when you start to make inferences from models with many different structures, to infer the same thing, you often get mixed results and then again, lose trust in the models. So um, I was speaking about guidelines, both for the decision maker and in the modeling, standardizing the modeling process for gene drives. Yeah, I think I would add that, you know, guidelines broadly are just important for communicating so everybody can be on the same page. And I think that you know, a, any guidelines would be very difficult to like outline as like, you know, a model must do this. Cause I think that, again, it really depends on the question at hand and the system and what's important. So when we're saying guidelines, we're more so trying to articulate out, you know, methods maybe and a process, but the process can become more detailed and provided with a lot of examples. 
Yeah, I think this sort of harkens back to actually the first the first webinar when Mike Bonsall was talking about sort of a common set of um, a common set of models, a uh, library of models that you know would would eventually evolve that people would be using. Um, I don't know if this will come out of the review that you're putting together, but do you think that this the state of where the the, the field is at this point um, is at the point where we might be able to identify common you know libraries of models that 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 have enough that have had enough use that they can be reliable or you know, that people can that that a regulatory agency can say uh, yeah we we would consider results from model x as part of our um as part of our decision making process but not necessarily model yeah y. yeah i think the difficulty there um i think there's plenty of resources out there to develop a database like that um part of the difficulty is what language you're coding your models in um and so that's kind of been like just off the top of my head i can think of there's mathematica people using matlab both those you have to purchase People are building tools in R, which is a freeware um, software. Uh, and then there's other programs you can buy to like do more like Bayesian belief networks. And so I think that, yeah, we're definitely at a place where we can start aggregating these functions. But I think that, you know, it's, <laughs> it's difficult, right? Because basically what we're talking about is building theory around a lot of complex phenomena and how they interact. And yeah, I think that, you know, having a set of simpler models to kind of explore the dynamics across certain questions, so maybe an ensemble of models to like start plugging and playing makes more sense than maybe having like a database with like all these functions, and you just choose X and add it in and all of a sudden it populates a, you know, a specific model structure because it's a, it's a bit more complicated than that because the math changes and structure changes. And, and also, but, also I think you need sometimes you need different model structures for different objectives. Like we, we talked about this and um, you know, that what I picture, like what Michael said with the whole library of models, like, I think I can't speak for him, but it seemed like he had in mind also, you know, you would use model X for question Y um, and that whole process needs to be developed like what is what are the objectives we're going to ask with models and then we need to have a suite of models that can address those different objectives because you're not going to use the same model for every objective so there can't be just like one standardized method there but in terms of like i spoke more broadly about the modeling process and i think that can be a standardized method yeah i, I think it's a complex goal because i think you know, even you think of birth functions, there's so many ways we can build the model to try and capture the same process. And so even that, I bet there, you know, there's disagreements in the field and what's the best. And in reality, we have to match it with data, right? And even that is, you know, data on density dependence across a number of species, you know, for most, it doesn't exist. Great, thanks. Um, the final question we have on this list is uh, from Brian again. Kim, great presentation. Um, he would like your explanation and emphasis on validating the model. He said, oh, sorry. He likes your explanation and emphasis on validating the model with field data and wonders how you feel about the lack of data regarding the spread of the gene drive in the field to validate the model. Yeah, that's not very good. <laughs> but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I think there are some things we can do to get close to this. Um, like right now, um, Andrew and I have a collaboration with some colleagues at NWRC, um, Tony Piaggio and Aaron Shields, where we are trying to get funding to validate some of the models in a captive setting with, so they're not exactly natural populations, but they will have some of the features of natural populations, like we can manipulate sex ratios and densities and um, those, sor those sorts of ecological parameters. And so that can help develop our models to make them slightly more realistic. And then I think as a field, we need to think together about what defining what these validation data could be in a realistic setting um, 
And, you know, in a, in a workshop I attended a few years ago, we talked about maybe releasing a marker. So, so you have the gene drive mechanism for a marker gene, and that wouldn't be exactly the same as, you know, a gene that's going to suppress a population there. But, you know, if we can model the spread of a marker gene with all the complexities of the mating structure and dispersal, then that could be some validation data for um, efficacy and risk. And I, I just think we need to really be having this conversation needs to be forefront on our minds right now as modelers and decision makers, how we're going to validate these models. Yeah, and I think that gets to the, the issue of trust in the models. Um, if you know, the more validation that we get, even if it's not direct from point of view of having an actual gene drive construct out there, the the higher confidence that the decision makers are going to have in, in those models. So, well, um, we, we've come to the, the end of our list of questions and I wanna thank you both again for, uh, as you can tell from the number of questions we did get, we, you know, it was a very interesting and very informative talk. And we, again, thank you both for, for taking the time to prepare the talks and, uh, and being here today. So, um, Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, I'm, I'm going to switch now then to advertise next week's talk, which is going to be by Wayne Landis at, um, at Western Washington University. And um, he's going to be talking to us next week about the um, application of quantitative ecological risk assessment in, to the release of gene drives. And uh, and Wayne, as I as you might, as some of you might note, was one of the members of the uh, National Academies uh, Committee that wrote the report on their re their report on gene drives, and I'd be very interested to hear what he says about this particular aspect of it. Mm -hmm.